Today, I'm going to try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Dark-type Pokemon. Black 2 and White 2 can be very challenging games, part of the reason why I love them so much, but there are actually a good amount of potential Dark-type encounters that we can get, including quite a few that we've never used before in our Nuzlocke's, and a potential bonus one made possible by a hidden encounter method, so I can't wait for this. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Black 2 with only the first Dark-type that we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and a battle mode on set at all times. Before we get into it, here's a fun fact. There are 7.5 billion people out there that could be playing Raid Shadow Legends, today's video sponsor right now, so why waste time? Download it on mobile or PC using my QR code or links below. You won't believe this. Raid's released a new legendary champion based off MMA and pro wrestling legend, Ronda Rousey. As well as taking on dragons and ice golems with her bare fists, Ronda's backstory is pretty cool, taking some inspiration from her background in combat sports, but I won't spoil anything. New or Longtime player, you can get Ronda for free right now just by logging in. Just play Raid for 7 days between now and February 20th and Ronda's yours. This month, Raid's also got a huge update with a ton of new features including a brand new dungeon and the introduction of the Artifact Ascension. Battle through the Sand Devil's Necropolis and earn the precious oil needed to take your artifacts to the next level. There are a bunch of new champions being added into the mix too, including really cool holiday champions, and the Bastion's even been decorated in-game to look all wintry too, which I love. Amazon Prime member? You can get exclusive rewards in Raid right now too. To celebrate Ronda's arrival, you can also use the special promo code RAIDRONDA to get a bunch of helpful stuff like a 3-day 100% XP boost, 500k silver, and 5 full energy refills perfect for leveling up your Ronda to her peak. Just enter promo code RAIDRONDA in game and all of it is yours. New players? Use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack worth almost $30. A free champion and Virgies, and also this cool in-game loot too. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Alright, here we go, it's time to tackle one of the best games in the franchise. Come to think of it, it's really weird how out of all the characters in the entire main series, they chose Ingo of the Battle Subway from these games to put in Legends. A very strange choice, but I'm not complaining, it was cool to see him again. Beginning our journey, we... <laughs> Why are we just standing in the middle of the room doing nothing, just possessed? Don't you knock, woman. Heading outside, we run into good old Hugh and his sister and... Insert blatantly obvious foreshadowing here. Meeting up with Bianca at the lookout, we get to pick our starter, and unfortunately none of them get the dark type, but we are gonna pick Snivy, who I nicknamed Foreman. This way, Hugh will get Tepig, which will evolve into a part fighting type, making it the toughest challenge for us. <laughs> Hugh asked for a Pokemon too, and she just looks at him awkwardly and says, Um, who are you again? Savage. Well, Foreman almost ended our run immediately during our first battle with Hugh, as we got crit on the very first attack. That's not a good sign for the run, is it? Thankfully, we did make it through with the help of the defense drop from Lear, and him only using non-attacking moves from there. With that, we get some Pokeballs from Bianca, meaning our Dark-type journey has officially begun. I'm Batman. It's kind of weird to be starting our journey off on Route 19, but this is the location of our first encounter, in fact, a Purloin. We catch it successfully and nickname him Michael, and Michael has a bashful nature which is neutral, meaning no increases or decreases on any of our stats. It also has the unburdened ability to raise its speed if its item is used, but an eventual Lipard doesn't need much speed, so Limber to prevent all paralysis would have been better, but I can't complain. With that, it's a sad time as we have to permanently box Foreman. Goodbye, old friend. I'll never forget the 80 steps we took together. Now the fortunate part about this run is that everything on this route gives either attack or speed EVs, so we can exclusively battle level 2s to get a good amount without getting too much XP to get near the level cap. Uh... Oh no... Not the conspicuous grass patch again, and this time with a white snow stain too... Oh boy... I won't say a word... Our second battle with Hugh near the ranch was even closer than last time with us edging him out on 7 HP, and to deal with that trauma it's time for a therapy session. Ah, much better. Encountering a Team Plasma Grunt up ahead, he gets angry and throws a Frustration TM at us, and given Michael's limited move pool, I think this might be great early on, as it increases in power the less friendly the Pokemon is at the time. Another upgrade comes in the form of Alder giving us some Orin Berries, and with that, it's time for the very first gym, Aspersia City. Technically being a trainer school for new Pokemon owners, you'd imagine the gym trainers themselves would go pretty smoothly, but with same type attack bonus or stab normal moves, and other moves like Leer and War 
Orca, the Patch Rats and Lily Pups in here were actually quite nerve-wracking to deal with. We also don't have a stab move of our own, and our own defenses are terrible, but thankfully we scraped by. Realizing that Scratch is not going to cut it anymore, I teach Michael the Frustration TM in preparation for the first gym leader, Charon, our former rival from the original games and the normal type expert now. I'm not going to lie, his team is pretty terrifying this early on, but without any further ado, let's give it a shot. Charon leads with a Patch Rat, and we outspeed and hit it with Frustration, which does about a third before he then charges up his attack with Work Up. Another hits him just to the red, then a tackle does a third on us. He then potions, but fortunately it doesn't quite heal him up all the way, so we can hit two more consecutive attacks to take him down from there. Not bad. In comes his ace though, Lillipop. Frustration only does a quarter on him, and then he work ups as well. Uh oh. Another brings him below half, and then he hits a tackle, and we survive on just 5 HP before our Orenberry, but that isn't gonna help us. The range is looking incredibly close here, and I don't quite think Frustration will take him down, so after much deliberating, I opt to risk it and go for Fury Swipes, our only way to maybe take him down if we get enough hits, but we only hit him twice, allowing him to smash us with a final tackle to end our run. Just two hits? Are you kidding me? That was brutal. Well, as per Hardcore Nuzlocke rules, a full reset is necessary to continue. Attempt number two is upon us, and this time I caught a purloin named Mikhail, who has a lax plus defense and minus special defense nature, which could be good for this battle at least, although we did get unburdened again. He does seem to have a slightly better attack stat though. It's time for the rematch, and sorry about the screen by the way, I have no idea what happened, but it's just for this battle, and this time we seem to tank his tackles a little bit better, although he got two hits right away to take us below half before our berry activated. Not good, but because of his potion we can then take him down the same way as last time. In comes his Lillipop, and I'm praying we can get something done here. Frustration does a third or so again, then he just goes for tackle to bring us below half again, then we hit him to a third before he hits us, but we survive on 4 HP, and this time the range for frustration looks okay, so I go for it, and we take him down with a crit anyway. Pretty sure we had that regardless, but I appreciate the assurance, Mikhail. First badge acquired after two attempts, and honestly, with just a purloin at the moment, I'll take it. We also get the workup TM for winning, not bad at all. Outside the gym though, we get an amazing TM from Bianca, Return, which does the opposite of frustration and will get more powerful as time goes on, providing Mikhail doesn't hate us. In no time, we arrive in Verbank City, the location of the next gym, and also where some family drama is apparently unfolding. Using some secret methods like, well, walking in the sewers essentially, we can grab a great item, the Silk Scarf to boost normal moves, and we can also get the Thief TM near the port, which is always great for getting type boosting items off wild Pokemon, but also it's a dark type move after all, so might actually be useful in battle. Now, knowing what lies ahead, I do a ton of running around like a madman to improve Mikhail's friendship to the max. It takes a long time, but eventually I think we've got it as I teach him the return TM, after which it's time for the Verbank Gym. This was a very good chance to test out the return and silk scarf combo, and it did end up being quite powerful, but... Disable makes this very dangerous, and I didn't even think of it. This only allows us to use 40 power pursuit, and our very first trainer battle ended up almost costing us the run, as we had to take on a defensive coughing with only it and got brought down to just 10 HP while poisoned in the process. Sheesh. Now after a ton of theory crafting, I think I know our best viable plan for the second gym leader, Roxy the Poison Specialist. Unfortunately, it turns out Purloin can't learn workup apparently, and my calcs tell me that the range isn't quite there with the Silk Scarf either, so I go with an Orenberry instead as she leaves with coughing. The key here? We just cannot get poisoned, as she has Venishock waiting in the back, which doubles in power if we do. We hit return, and it does just about a third, and it turns out she goes for tackle instead of smog. That's good. Another brings her to the red as she hits us again, but then she is super potions. This allows us two consecutive hits before she hits us below half and activates our berry, then we can take her down with the final attack. In comes the big threat though, Venipede, and I am incredibly nervous at this point. We hit a return, and it does only about a quarter or so before she just uses Pursuit. Uh, okay then, as another hit brings her to a quarter, and then she hits a Venoshock, and we survive on just 15 HP so we can hit another to KO her and end the battle. It seems like we would have survived two Venoshocks anyway, so I'd say we handled that pretty well. The only major risk was getting poisoned or crit. 
Oh boy, here comes my favorite thing in the entire franchise. Don't you just love this place? No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 After Roxy proceeds to parent her parent, we can take the ship onward to Castelia City, a pretty ridiculous accomplishment on the DS by my estimation. Now, Castelia is humongous, we all know that, and here we can grab a ton of great items such as the Quick Claw, and even the XP share to help avoid the level cap and get more EVs on Pokemon before they hit it. Now, one thing I didn't realize is that the sewer would actually be all dried up because it's winter time, and this actually made navigating this place a heck of a lot easier, leading us to one of the best items in the game, the leftovers. Along the way, we finally get our first evolution too, as good old Mikhail evolves into a Lipard at level 20, giving us some more power for sure. In the small relic passage area at the back, there comes an item I think might be handy later on, the Hardstone. Now, this isn't the only secret area back here, as we can also access where the city apparently first started, Castelia Park. And this is going to be the location of our next encounter. It took a while to find, but eventually we find it, an Eevee, which I nicknamed Norman. Norman ends up having a docile, neutral nature, and also the bite move, pretty good as we're of course going to evolve it into a dark type eventually. Now, I went up ahead here to Route 4 for two purposes, but I made a big mistake. I was trying to fill up our Pokedex for a particular reason, but forgot that in doing so, I'd encounter a Pokemon that I eventually want to find purposefully as an encounter, Sandile. Whoops, you'll see why this is a problem later. I'm forced to catch this one though, so I name it Lecter, and it at least does have the Intimidate ability, along with an impish plus defense and minus special attack nature. Pretty good. Heading back to the city, I make sure to have the masseuse give Norman a massage to raise his friendship, before putting the game down until nighttime. With that massage, a ton of running, and it now being nighttime, we can evolve Norman into an actually viable Pokemon for the run, Umbreon. Amazing. This should finally give us some incredible bulk on our team. Well, my stupid mistake at least gets us right to 40 Pokemon seen in our Pokedex, meaning we can now get a wicked item, the Eviolite from this scientist. And exploring further also had us find things like the Twisted Spoon, Rest TM, and the Scope Lens too. It's time for the third gym, which, yup, is a bug-type gym, so it's quite scary. However, with Umbreon heavily EV trained in defenses, this is a huge asset early on, especially with the leftovers, as he's able to tank through the trainers pretty well even with their super effective moves. At the top of this spidery hellhole stands the third gym leader, Berg, and normally I'd be worried here, but I realized something looking at his team. The only bug moves he has are special, struggle bug, yet his team is full of physical attackers, so I lead with Norman against his Swadloon, and immediately start loading up on work up to raise our attack power. If if I'm honest, he couldn't really do much to us, and with raised attack and the leftovers giving us constant recovery, we were able to smash through his Swadloon and Dwebble taking hardly any damage in the process. In comes his ace, Levani, and we do have to watch for Razor Leaf crits, but after missing his first one, we were able to consistently smash him with Faint Attack, even through his Hyper Potion, and he never got a crit either, so we ended the battle on just below half before our recovery, winning us the third badge. Much better than you might expect from a Dark Team. Now, normally there's a really tough battle for most types up ahead on Route 4 against Colrus, a Steel-type trainer, but with the Eviolite attached, we have the perfect answer, Lecter, who smashes his Magnemite to Sturdy with with Sand Tomb, but not only that, because of the residual damage, we technically took down a Sturdy Mon in one hit. Too good. From there, his Clink was handled into attacks thanks to the residual damage, taking us down to 30 HP with Gear Grind in the process, but the Eviolite helped us pull through. I guess it was worth catching him early after all. Up ahead, we can grab some crucial citrus berries, which can be hard to come by in this game, and we also get the Dig TM, which is fantastic. Now, this is the unfortunate part. Normally on this route, you can straight up catch a white to exclusive otherwise, a fully evolved Mandibuzz. But it's only available on Thursdays anyway, so in a sense, I'm glad I didn't have to delay my schedule. We could have gotten Sand Isle and Relic Castle instead, thereby allowing us that Route 4 encounter, but oh well. Up ahead, we enter the Desert Resort, and after very painfully learning that our encounter is only available on the outside part of it, we finally find it, a Scraggy, which I catch and nickname Gollum. Gollum also has a docile nature and the Moxie ability to increase attack every time he gets a KO, too. 
Pretty cool. Not only that, but the soft sand to boost Lecter's ground moves is also here too. All right, now with this absolute giga chad doesn't convince you, let me tell you, make sure to do this join avenue stuff in your runs. You can get some great items from it as we'll see later. Arriving in Nimbasa City has me really wanting to go to Disneyland or something as there's just too much fun going on here. And right now I'm in a frozen arctic tundra. And in the eastern gate we can grab the macho brace to boost the EVs that we get further. As might be expected going to a place like Vegas, we ended up in the backwoods somewhere with a shady guy dealing us some... Uh, TMs, and he starts talking about a weird Pokemon named Zoro- Hey, wait just a minute! Come back here, you son of a b The Nimbasa gym is upon us, and normally this gym is complete brutality, but with Lecter on our side, we can blow through the trainers quite handily. Not only that, but along the way, we have a crucial evolution as Lecter evolves into a wickedly cool Krokorok. He not only learned Crunch too, but I also taught him the Dig TM as he doesn't learn it by level up until after the cap anyway. Don't forget, he can still hold the Eviolite, so this should be good as we challenge the 4th Gym Leader, Elisa, the Electric Gym Leader, and... Wow, how electric she is indeed, immediately throwing off all her clothes. I... I thought this was a Pokémon battle. Now, Elisa thankfully doesn't have the two Volt Switching Emolgas that she has in the originals, but Lecter intimidates her and forces her to use the physical quick attack since she can't Volt Switch anyway and Crunch is powerful enough to get the two-hit KO on it. Alrighty then. In comes her Flaffy next, and we can outspeed, avoid her attack underground, then slam her for the one-hit KO with Dig. Damn. Zeb Striker then comes out and outprioritizes us with Quick Attack, which does get a crit, but Lecter is just too damn powerful and wipes it off the map with Dig as well. I... I think that's the easiest Elisa battle we've ever had. Normally she's a nightmare. Four badges down. Oh, knowing Ingo's fate in Legends Arceus, it's kind of sad seeing him here in his prime with his brother. Crossing the Charizard Bridge, which bears zero resemblance to a damn Charizard by the way, we arrive in Driftvale City and... What is this, GTA 5? I thought this was supposed to be Gen 5. <laughs> now, oddly enough, our next encounter is actually found right here in the city, as it's a gift Pokemon given to us by none other than former Team Plasma Sage, Rude. Yes, that's his name. He's not Rude, though. He's, he's actually quite nice. It's a gift. Anyway, it ends up being a Zoroa, which we can't nickname since it previously belonged to N. It has a hasty nature though, plus speed and minus defense, which isn't bad. Our trusty friend in the market then gives us one of the best items in the game, the Expert Belt to boost the power of super effective moves. And let's go say hi to the other locos, shall we? I... Uh, what? <laughs> In one of the hotels, we grab an item that we might have a good use for later, the Big Root. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that to be honest, and another dude gives us the air balloon too. Pretty cool items, kinda niche though. While training up for the next gym, we have a great evolution as Zoroa evolves into a Zoroark at level 30. I don't think I've ever really used one of these before, so I can't wait. Gotta say, the Driftvale gym looks darn cool at nighttime, and as it turns out, Golem with the Eviolite is actually a great counter to most of the gym trainers, as they tend to have things like psychic type ball toys, and taking them down gives us an attack boost from Moxie each time, making them easier as the battle goes on. The fifth gym leader is Clay, the ground type expert, and looking at his team, I think I have a great play in mind. He leaves with a croc rock with Intimidate, unfortunate as our whole team is comprised of physical attackers, but I lead with Gollum regardless. Knowing we need the extra power with our lowered attack, I go for high jump kick, and not only do we hit it, but it one hit KOs. Unbelievable. That then awards us with the Moxie boost to bring our attack back up, and he did go for Torment, but I wasn't planning on using that again anyway. Against his Sand Slash, I could then merely alternate between Dumble Power Payback since he outspeeds us and Brick Break, making the Torment not a big deal, and with the Eviolite, he couldn't do much damage against us before we took him down in three hits and got another Moxie boost. In comes his final Pokemon, his ace, Excadrill. He hits us with Metal Claw to below half and gets the attack boost, but with plus one attack and a calculated alternating of attacks to ensure that we could use super effective Brick Break against this thing when it came in, Gollum demolishes him in one single hit. What a demon. Moving on to the Pokemon World Tournament, we can pick up a Rocky Helmet item, great for giving opposing Pokemon recoil damage for attacking us. How dare they? And ironically enough, you can actually pick up a second one of these right nearby in the Relic Passage. 
pretty funny stuff. The regional tournament itself is always scary with consecutive battles, but leading with Lecter was amazing for automatic intimidate, and the expert bell combined with 80 power stab, dark, and ground moves gave us fantastic coverage against Hugh and Colrus, pulling us through without losing anyone. Now, honestly, I have no recollection how I got here on this pirate ship, which makes me a bit concerned, but, uh, this is a massive group of people. I wonder what the record is for the most characters on screen in a 2D Pokemon game is. This has got to be up there. With that trip behind us, we head up Route 6 to arrive in Chargestone Cave, definitely one of the coolest places in Unova. There are no major battles in here, just some navigational issues to overcome, and uh, Bianca's here for some reason, so yeah. We make it through to the other side and arrive in Mistralton City, where the next gym is. Before hitting it up, we could use some training, so I wander around Route 7 a bit and not only pick up the Exazer TM, which might be good later, but also encounter Marshall at the entrance to Twist Mountain. I love how Elite Four members are just found throughout the region in some of these games. Definitely a far cry from the days of Gen 1, when you just didn't find out who they were until you found out by them pummeling you into the ground. During the training, we have a great evolution as Gollum evolves into a Scrafty, giving us quite a surprisingly defensive beast, but uh, I don't think he'll be very useful right now though, as next up is the Mistralton Gym. This place has got a great design and a really fun kind of puzzle element with the wind and all, and overall the trainers weren't too bad at all, as a lot of them have things like the psychic type Swoobat, and a fake out plus outspeed with assurance handled them pretty darn well from Mikhail. Not too often you have something on your team that can outspeed a Swoobat, so you gotta take advantage of it when you can. The sixth gym leader is Skyla, the flying type expert, and honestly, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about this one as she has some big threats on her team, especially that Skarmory which we have like no way to deal with and it resists dark too. Fortunately, at least she leads with a Swoobat so I can outprioritize it and flinch it with Fake Out like the others, then hit it with Assurance, which actually still gets the KO. Nice job, Mikhail. Now, here's where things went wonky. I expected Skarmory to come out next, but she sent out Swana. Huh. Our only option here is Norman, as he's our only defensive Pokemon aside from our one that's weak to flying, and we tank an Air Slash reasonably well. However, as we go for workup, she goes for Feather Dance, negating our attack boost. Ugh. She then crits us out of nowhere with Air Slash below half, and Faint Attack hardly does anything at all. Not good. She then hits us again, and we flinch. Are you kidding me? I know we can survive a non-crit, so I go for another attack, but she flinches us for a second turn in a row. I have no words, just zero. Our defensive core is now shattered with a crit, flinch, flinch combo. Feeling defeated, I switch into Mikhail for the long shot, and we tank Air Slash just over half. This being our first turn back on the field, I can at least use Fake Out to flinch now, followed by a return for as much damage as possible, but it's not much, and she survives in the red before her berry. Then, she uses Roost on top of it. According to the ranges, we should be able to survive another, so I hit her with return again. Then Mikhail tanks the next attack on just 2 HP, so we can outspeed and finally take that damn thing down. Holy, that was close. In comes perhaps the hardest threat to deal with though, Skarmory. Here, I switch in Lecter for the Intimidate immediately, and then Steel Wing doesn't do much. Having lowered her attack, I then go for Torment so she'll never be able to use the same move twice, and then she uses Agility. From here, I kept landing crunches desperately hoping to get the defense drop on her, but in three attacks, we don't get it, and we're getting too low on health. I have to switch, and with not many options remaining, I go into Gollum, and she has a special flying move, Air Cutter, but it honestly doesn't do a whole lot, and she can't use it twice in a row anyway, so... With the help of leftovers and with her hyper potioning, we end up below half before our sixth Burk Break finally does the job. That was insane. Not even gonna comment on this battle. A peaceful flight to Lentimus Town is next on the agenda, and this has gotta be one of the most forgotten yet coolest towns in the series. And no, not just because we can finally get a special stab move on Zoroark using the Move Tutor here to get Dark Pulse on him, but it's just a cool desert place, you know? Just to the east, we actually have a new encounter opportunity in the exterior of Twist Mountain, as here we can find... a Skorupi, which I catch in a Dusk Ball and nickname Landa. 
Landa has a plus special defense and minus speed nature, and honestly, for an eventual Drapion, minus speed is not great at all, but we at least finally get some more type coverage. Speaking of cool places in the Pokemon games, how about this? There is a massive difference between Black 2 and White 2 in this cave, but honestly, I think I might like this water-themed one a little bit more. Oh, we also encountered a terrifying double battle against a Darmanitan and Excadrill of all things, but Lecter absolutely saved the day with the Double Intimidate and Eviolite combo, just barely scraping by since they went for Musharna instead of us on one turn. Whew, that could have been bad. After breaking up with Bianca finally, we arrive in another scenic spot, the tropical beachfront of Andela Town. I was wandering around on Route 14, I think it was, where we're apparently not supposed to be as... Uh... Well, at least Game Freak was honest this time. They just straight up ran out of excuses for these arbitrary roadblocks that they put up. The Hue battle here was kind of funny as I thought his Embor had a fighting move, but apparently only has takedown, and I was dying trying to figure out how to handle his Sibby poor too, but he actually burned Norman with Scald, meaning our Synchronize activated, and that burned him in turn, taking him down after our attack barely left him on a sliver. Now that was cool, and I wish I could have said it was planned. Up next is Route 13, and here we can grab a brand new encounter, Absol, which I quickly found out has the Swords Dance move already, and which I catch a nickname Jason. Jason has an impish nature, plus defense, and minus special attack, and the super luck ability for a higher critical hit ratio. Uh, okay, a legendary fighting and steel type Pokemon? Yeah, you're my team sports nightmare, dude. I'm out of here. Now, Lacunosa Town, well, there's not much to say about this place, although we can get the metronome item to power up consecutively used moves. A bit ahead, and we have some great team upgrades as Lecter evolves into a beastly crocodile, and not only that, but Landa also evolves into a monster Drapion too, making him usable with the Dark type now. Up ahead on the village bridge, there's this dude who claims to be on a 999 win streak, and we have to battle him. The game won't let us by, and he has a terrifying team for a dark type run. So I had led with Lecter for the Intimidate on his Durant of all things, and then switched into Landa, who's the only thing not weak to his moves. Ultimately, I was hoping for a crit from the Night Slash, and we did get one. I was also trying to bait the bug move when I had Lecter out, which he didn't use, so I sent him in again for the double Intimidate, and was like, alright, he seems not to have a bug move, so I stay in. But all of a sudden, he goes for a bug bite, and not only that, but gets a crit to immediately destroy Lecter. This was such a damn painful and unfair loss. Right after we got the evolution I was most excited for, too. Why did he not go for that the first time we had him out? Thankfully, Gollum was able to tank it out with both Durant and his damn fighting-type Lucario thanks to Moxie. What a brutal battle for a team like this. Alright, move the f*** out of my way. I am not having this right now. Opelucid City is now upon us, and in a fit of anger, I head straight for the 7th gym. Honestly, Zoroark went absolutely to work in here after I fully EV trained him, smashing everything with Dark Pulse, and I was very safe with my calculations. That is, until this random trainer's Dredagon revealed that it had a Dragon Gem and obliterated him. What is actually happening right now? Alright, that's it. Those two deaths sent me into a fury as we faced the 7th gym leader, Drayden, the Dragon Expert. I decide to go in with Jason, who has the super luck ability, high critical hit ratio Night Slash, and I attach the scope lens on him, so realistically almost every hit should be critical. And I use Swords Dance off the bat, after which his Dredagon hit a critical hit slash of his own, but we survive on less than half, and after EV training speed like mad, can proceed to outspeed and take down every single one of his team members with a plus two Night Slash. Now that is power. Suddenly, floating pirate ship with massive cannon that shoots ice at giant cities because, well, it says so. Here we have to battle one of the Team Plasma leaders, Zinzolin, and I was fretting a bit about his team, but then I realized we have a perfect counter, Gollum. As he puts in work, and more importantly, doesn't die, with super effective stab, expert belt boosted brick break annihilating his cryogonal, then being able to sweep another one, and his Weavile with ever-increasing Moxie power. That's what I like to see. And the same one for the Shadow Triad too, with their Ponyards and Absol. Everything is weak to fighting. West of Opelousid on Route 9, we have another encounter chance, and we eventually find it, a Ponyard of our own, which I catch and nickname Kruger, and who has a careful plus special defense and minus special attack nature. Not bad. Unfortunately, he does evolve after the next level cap though, which is quite crazily late. 
A gorgeous trip through the marine tube later and we arrive in the final gym destination, Humalau City. One of the houses here actually offers us something quite amazing. There's a move tutor who can teach Gollum a new fighting move, Drain Punch, which also has 75 power but of course gives us recovery back, which should be really great in tandem with Moxie now that I think about it. The Humalau gym is such a darn cool one, honestly one of the best gym designs out there, and with type neutrality going both ways here, we kind of just have to tank our way through with a few close calls here and there. The 8th gym leader is Marlin, the water type specialist, and looking at his team, I was like, oh, I know what to do. He leads with a Karakasta, so I send out Gollum, and with our newly learned Drain Punch, there's just no way he can do much against us. Unless he gets a burn, but thankfully doesn't. With Moxie then activating, we can take down his Wailord in two hits as well, as it just went for Amnesia for some reason. Then finally, his Jellicent is of course weak to Dark and gets obliterated by Crunch after he hit a Scald, but didn't burn either. Much better. With all eight badges in hand, we can hit up the Seaside Cave to pick up what might be a crucial TM, Toxic, before then taking on some more Team Plasma Grunts on the Frigate. During the process, we have an unreal evolution as Kruger evolves into a Bisharp, all the way at level 52. It's very weird to think that even this is a Pokémon that can evolve now in Gen 9. Facing Zinzolin again, I realized something. We have an even better counter for him than Gollum, as Bisharp not only has more power, but also super effectiveness from Steel, and resists Ice on top of that, and I had even taught him Brick Break via TM to break their Reflect. What an absolute perfect way to handle him, and, uh, I kinda realized, is Kruger wearing a thong here? We have yet another encounter opportunity here, but not a standard one. You see, using the Dream World, but only after obtaining 8 badges in Black 2 and White 2, we can access the Rugged Mountain, where we can pick up none other than a Larvitar. Amazing. I name him Terminator, and he has a lax plus defense and minus special defense nature. I'm gonna replace Mikhail with him for now, as he offers quite a bit more, and in no time he evolves into a Pupitar, such a cool middle stage evolution. Confronting Team Plasma in the Giant Chasm, we... Hey! Jesus, Hugh, calm down! After picking up the Razor Claw item, Kruger goes on yet another senseless slaughter of Zinzolin. Honestly, I'm starting to feel sorry for the guy. And we make it to the end of the frigate to face its final boss, Chorus. Now, this guy's team is always a huge struggle for us, and is very powerful and troublesome with Sturdy everywhere too, but I think for the first time ever, we might actually have a relatively viable way through him. He leads with a Magneton, and I send out Kruger. Brick Break does over half, then he volts which is immediately. Not what I was expecting, as in comes Magnezone. Brick Break then hits him hard too, but then he hits a Thunder Wave to paralyze, but I had attached a Cherry Berry so we can outspeed and decimate him with another. From there, it was a super effective slaughter. As we could Brick Break Clang Clang twice as he just used Shift Gear, Magneton then came back in at less than half health and was easy pickings, then both his Metang and Behem are both weak to Night Slash and have no real way to damage us, so they could just be picked off as well for the victory. Never seen anything like that against Chorus. Kruger, you are a legend. Okay, straight up, this is the ultimate gamer setup. Right before the big show, we have a crazy evolution as our beloved Terminator finally evolves into a monster Tyranitar, one of my favorite Pokemon of all time. Getsus then attempts to murder us, and giant legendary dragons break into the cave and start fighting. You know, typical day in the life. And we now have the final Team Plasma battle against Getsus, always a ridiculously tough one with a team like this. He leads with a Kafagrigus, and I lead with Landa. Kafagrigus' main strength here is that it can toxic you, but with Landa, that doesn't apply, so I could steadily apply pressure with Crunch as he just repeatedly hit resisted Shadow Balls. In comes a huge threat though that took me a while to theorycraft for, Seismitoad, which I purposefully baited out with Landa. Here I switch in Norman, and after teaching him Toxic, I can now essentially Toxic stall him with the help of both Leftovers and Moonlight for recovery. Although, Earthquake was hitting quite hard, so we had to time it right, but eventually, he goes down. In comes his own Drapion, so I switch into Terminator, who unfortunately doesn't have Sandstream, and x and Earthquake were both super effective and hit us hard, but we unleashed with an Earthquake of our own for the one hit against him. Now that was a display of dominance if I've ever seen one. In comes one of the biggest threats, Toxicroak. I had to think about this one for a while, but eventually switched in Jason as he hit a brick break, and I knew we should survive, and we do on just 9 HP and can outspeed to land the 4x super effective Psycho Cut for the KO. Whew. 
Up next is Hydreigon, and as scary as this is, we have the perfect counter, Gollum who I switch into to give him Rocky Helmet damage, then I was gonna go for Drain Punch, but he hits a Dragon Rush and flinches us. What? Are you kidding me? So from there, I was forced to switch into Kruger to resist it, but he missed his next one anyway. Then his second one didn't do much at all, so Brick Break finishes him off. His final Pokemon is Electros, which does have Flamethrower, so I switch in Norman to absorb it and then proceed to Toxic Stall him into Oblivion as well, as he's a tricky Mon to deal with. Not bad. In the giant chasm cave, we can also pick up our final encounter, none other than a Sneasel, which I catch and nickname Durden, who's going into the box for now. Our final adventure is upon us as we arrive at the perilous Victory Road, to be greeted by good old N before entering through the gates. Now, in Victory Road, there technically is another encounter we could get, Zvilus, but it would evolve past the level cap anyway, unfortunately, and we have rocked it with an Eviolite before in our Dragon Run, so I think I'm gonna leave him unless we lose like three mons in Victory Road. As it turns out, we make it to the end unscathed, but we have one final test, Hugh. His team is actually quite terrifying for us, and I theorycrafted for a while for this fight and eventually came up with a plan. He leaves with Unpheasant, and now we have Terminator, the perfect counter against him. He actually won for Swagger off the bat, and we hit ourselves in confusion. Then, he landed a critical hit U-turn of all things to bring us below half immediately. But then, when his Simipore came out, we actually snapped out of confusion and landed a massive power rock slide. With the plus attack from Swagger, I was like, wait a minute, and indeed could outspeed and take down his Ambor with Earthquake, then even his Bufalant with Brick Break afterward. That was unreal. His final Pokemon is then his Unpheasant again, but it has Super Luck and a Scope Lens, so I had to switch. And I kid you not, he kept critting the hell out of our Pokemon and using Hyper Potions, so I had to go through Kruger and Drapion nearly got taken out too before we could land a final crunch on 42 HP to get the win. Sheesh. Well, we've arrived. The Pokemon League. Now, we do have all the ingredients to get a Weavile right now, but looking at the Elite Four team composition, I don't really think he helps us out offensively, and just adds yet another four times weakness to fighting, and we've already used Weavile in our runs a few times, so I think I'm gonna leave Durden in the box to have a nice rest. After fulfilling the rest of our EVs, getting any remaining items we need, and strategizing like a madman, it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost-type trainer. Now, with a Dark Team, I was imagining we wouldn't have much difficulty, but her Cofagrigus can be a difficult lead with Will-O-Wisp. However, I attached a Rostberry on Jason and went for Swords Dance, but she just went for Shadow Ball, so, uh, we could then just freely sweep her entire team with a Stab Super Effective plus two Night Slash. And I mean, even if her Chandelure's Flame Body had activated, we would have been fine from the berry, so that was pretty darn clean. The second challenge is Grimsley, a fellow Dark-type trainer, and after thinking for a while, I think I have a good plan. He leaves with a Lipard, so I go in with Gollum with the Rocky Helmet. This way, his Lipard gets a recoil from Fake Out, but on the next turn, he uses a Tract. But I mean, what is Gollum in love with besides the Ring? So he destroys him with a Drain Punch and gets the Moxie Boost. And this was my plan. Gradually increasing our attack and then taking down his Scrafty too. And of course, his Bisharp was in big trouble with the four times weakness to fighting. And by the time his Crocodile then comes out with the Intimidate, it doesn't really matter, as we're still plus two attack and can take him down for the win. So much for our Dark-type Arch Nemesis. The third Elite Four member is Caitlyn, the Psychic-type trainer, and this was surprisingly tough to plan for, as her Musharna has both Yawn and Reflect, but I taught Tyranitar Brick Break in case we needed to break the Reflect, but as it turns out, the Terminator is powerful enough to not only take it down in one hit with Expert Belt helping, but also each and every one of her other three Pokémon, with only her Sigilyph outspeeding and landing an Ice Beam, which didn't do a whole lot. Alright, apparently this boy is aptly named. That's all I'm gonna say. Now, we've had a relatively easy time so far, but it's time for perhaps the biggest threat of all, the last Elite Four member, Marshall, the Fighting-type expert. Oh boy, I spent forever trying to figure out some strategy for him, and there just isn't one. Straight up. We have no coverage against him, and he has Sturdy here and there, Guts everywhere, and there's just no answer. With my best play in hand, let's just cross our fingers. He leads with a throw, so I send out Lando with the air balloon so we can't get hit by Bulldoze, and with battle armor so we can't get crit by guaranteed crit moves like Storm Throw. 
I go for Sword Stance off the bat, but he goes for Rock Tomb immediately, popping our balloon and lowering our speed. Not good. From there though, two Cross Poisons do the job, while he got a non-crit Storm Throw off to bring us below half. Now, that didn't go as I had hoped, as in comes Mian Xiao next, which is not what I was expecting either, so I realize nothing else can take a high jump kick from this thing, and I have to let Landa go. Ah. Uh... From here, I send in our bulkiest Ma, Norman, and strangely enough, he actually goes for Bounce here. I guess not seeing the high jump kick range, but he hits it and paralyzes us, but our Synchronize paralyzes him too. This is crazy, as we then land a Psychic to bring him below half. Then, he makes it through Paralysis, but misses high jump kick, crash lands, and takes himself out. Holy sh**. But, in comes Kong Kelder next, an absolute beast, and I know we can't switch here, so I stay in. He hits us hard with Hammer Arm, but we survive, but stay paralyzed, so a second one takes down Norman. With little hope remaining, I send out Jason to go for the high crit ratio Psycho Cut, with super luck, just praying for the crit, but we don't get it, and Hammer Arm eviscerates Jason immediately. This is not good. With no move that can take him out from this range, I send in Terminator with Unnerve so he at least can't use his Citrus Berry, hit an Earthquake, and he indeed survives in the red, lands a Hammer Arm, but I had a Choppel Berry on and we survive on just 43 HP even through 4 times super effectiveness. I go for Earthquake again, but he full restores. Ugh. I hit him again to a quarter, but then he went for Stone Edge, seeing the range I guess, and missed so another takes him down. Oh man! In comes his final Pokemon though, Sock, as we have no choice and he immediately takes Terminator down with a Brick Break. With just two Pokemon remaining, I send out Kruger, also four times weak to fighting. I hit an Iron Head just praying for the flinch, and we get it! So we can land another to take him down. That was both miraculous and miraculously disastrous at the same time. Unbelievable. It's time. The final battle, the champion of the Unova region, Iris, and we have just two Pokemon remaining and her team is straight up insane. This does not look good at all. Putting my all into planning? Well, I don't know what to say. Let's just try our best. She leaves with the Hydreigon, so I send out Gollum. Dragon Paul smashes us for a third before we can use Drain Punch, getting full recovery. Another does the same, and then we hit it again to take it down, and with leftovers helping this time, we get near full recovery plus the Moxie Boost. In comes Drudagon next, and we still do less than half with Drain Punch, then she lands a Focus Blast of all things, but we survive on a third. Now looking at this, the Drain Punch doesn't have the range to KO, and another Focus Blast would destroy us, so in the end, I decide to go for the 5 power stronger Crunch since I don't want to risk missing High Jump Kick, as that would end us, and it gets the range. Then in comes Agron. Thank god, I thought it was going to be Archeops, so now I can Drain Punch it for the 4 times super effectiveness and get full recovery. Then in comes a terrifying threat, the Archeops. Acrobatics would straight up one hit KO us here, and I don't want to lose the Moxie boost, but I have no choice, so I switch into Kruger, who at least resists every move that she has. So two attacks take us to just about half before Stab Super Effective Iron Head demolishes her. But in comes her ace, Haxorus, next, and I fear at this point we have to stay in, hoping she might Dragon Dance or something, but nope. She Earthquakes immediately to take Kruger down, and... Well, we have one remaining Pokemon, and she goes for Dragon Dance before we Drain Punch, and it hardly does anything. She Dragon Dances again, and I am terrified as a second Drain Punch takes her to below half. Realizing we don't have the range, I think I have an idea. She hits us with Earthquake, and we survive on a third, and now I can use Double Power Payback since she attacked us, giving us just the range to take her down. In comes her final Pokemon though, Lapras. Ice Beam hits us, and we survive in the red on just 27 HP before landing a Drain Punch, but she barely survives on a sliver. We do get a good amount of recovery, but as I feared, she full restores and survives on what must be 1 HP this time. Then, on the next turn, uses Sing. Oh god, why? Why couldn't she have just gone down? As now she gets to outspeed and hits a 50% sing of all things. I am desperately hoping and praying that we wake up as I see her HP dwindling. One hit, two hits, three hits. We need to wake up now. 
And we do, in just the nick of time, devastating her with a final Moxie Boost Drain Punch for the win. That was insane. But we did it, and that was an unreal journey full of new Pokemon we haven't used before, and honestly, some wicked strats that you wouldn't think would come from fighting types, since they're known for just being straight up powerhouses. I hope you had fun with the run, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoy, drop a like down below to help the video out, and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.